What's up? Sorry, I'm a little late. But I made it. How y'all doing? What's happening this week? Everybody at home? <laughs> Who's here in the house? We got Ben Coombs here. We got Kerry Miller. We got Rory. We got Chris Cam. We got uh, who else? Who else? Christopher's here and Rick. And uh, John Hutchinson. What's up, man? And uh, John says, let's just dive right in here with some guitar related stuff, shall we? Uh, best approach for a single ribbon mic on a guitar cab. Well, if you want the most natural sound, what I found is you can pretty much put a good ribbon dead center and back like a couple feet, kind of different than you would for sure a dynamic mic. Like dynamics are so sensitive to wherever you place them. You know, this is like the really, 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 really sensitive. Um, you can move a, a an SM57 just a half an inch or a quarter of an inch and the sound changes quite a bit. A ribbon's really quite forgiving. And if you place it back, actually, I can just show you like on my little Princeton here, it's only a, I guess, probably from the actual speaker, it's about a f almost a foot back, but it's six inches from the grill. Uh, I'll show you where I've got my M160 here on the Princeton. Um, so that's where it's placed. It's it's It looks closer in this photo, but it, it looks to me to be, well, it's four inches back maybe from the grill and pretty much dead center on the speaker. And you can kind of start there and you'll get a very natural sound, you know? They're, they're really forgiving. They're not, they're kind of rolled off in the top end a little bit, generally speaking, especially like the 160. It's, a, it's quite, quite warm. It's a very natural sounding microphone though, the 160. It sounds great on that amp. I mean, if you watch that, if you watch the tremolo demo I did recently for, excuse me, the Revival Trem, that's where that mic was placed. I'm just gonna turn down the slide a little bit. Um, exactly where you're seeing it. So you can hear the sound in that video of the, the uh, this one too, the, the uh, like when I was playing my Strat and, I think my 335 is what I use, Strat and 335 in that video. And you'll hear how kind of natural sounding the uh, the tone is, I think, coming out of that Princeton. Uh, John says, lots of EQ needed when I put a 121 right on the grill like you always see. Do you find the same? You, you probably you got to cut lows and low mids and stuff because they really have a, a fair amount of like a robust amount of warm, creamy low end, don't they? So... Uh, when you back the mic off, you'll find you get a more natural sound. Now, the only problem is if you're blending it with a 57, you're going to get phase cancellation then. So um, that's that's the dilemma. And what I have found with a 57 and a 121 is that, you know, the 57, the capsule is back a little bit from the front of the, the, the grill on the microphone. It's right about where it the printing is around the cap that says SM57 or whatever, Unidyne, whatever they say, you know? So if you, and, and likewise with a, with a, a 121 ribbon mic, the ribbon is right in the middle of, of the microphone about where that sort of flange is on the microphone. The, so you see the round part and then those, you know, kind of the wings on either side of the flange or whatever you want to call it. If you line up that flangey thing, the, whatever, you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. If you know, 121, if you line that up with the printing on the SM57 right on the cap, so it'll look like the 57 sticking out just a little bit further than the 121, but line that up with the, and that's right where the two capsules are properly aligned. Now imagine that you've got to take that and move both those things back. If you want the mics to stay in phase um, and not get some weird cancellation. So that's a consideration with a 121 because yeah, you're absolutely right. You're going to get with a 121 right on a grill, you do need to kind of EQ it, I find. It's too boomy, um, generally speaking. And so, and you can either EQ the whole, like if you blend the two mics, you can blend them to one track and then EQ the whole sound, depending on, you know, what's whatever sounds good, really. But sometimes it's good to kind of like just do, you know, a dip at like maybe 190 or 200 on, a, on an EQ on just a 121 or the ribbon mic. And just take some of that out and maybe do a low cut at like 70 or 80 or something like that. And just cut some of that, you know, I mean, you can experiment, but maybe a fairly wide dip, like as far as the, the Q um, of a couple dB, two to three dB or something like that. At maybe centered at like, 
you know, 190 or something like that on the, on that ribbon mic. And you'll find that'll clean up the sound and it'll have a nice balanced sound then. And then you can blend it with a 57 pretty, pretty much up on the grill and get a nice sound. So without being too redundant, if you, the original question was, where do you put the ribbon mic to just sound really natural? If you only use the ribbon, you experiment with, it's kind of amazing how good they sound back further than you might think, you know, to get a very natural sound. Like you can put them a couple feet back from an amp and actually get a great tone when, and especially a combo. I don't know. They just, there's no better microphone. I don't think for capturing like the, you know, cause most ribbons are figure eight, right? So, um, not on me, but figure eight. So they'll capture sound from the back too. So if you've got a nice sounding room and a combo in a room and you want a nice kind of airy, very natural kind of you know, tone and a, you know, kind of a, you know, very natural sound with a little bit of room in it and stuff. There's nothing like a ribbon back from a combo, just a little, you know, a foot or two. And it'll sound like, oh, that, and that's kind of what you hear maybe in that tremolo demo that I did with the, I think I'm not getting, you know, a ton of of sound off the back of the mic. But if you listen to the, the demo I did of the revival trem, you'll hear a bit of that. Um, and you'll find it's very forgiving as far as, how center it is on this on the cap you know you can take it out a little bit and yes it gets darker but not like a dynamic or it's just like this big shift in tone you know um so your hair is getting kind of long bro yeah i know it's growing i'm working on it i'm not really doing anything it's just happening but uh you know it's still there so i figure why not just let it do its thing uh leon says hey pete how much noise and hum is okay for a guitar in a mix it's a good question you know it's funny because like i've often talked about in here i get a lot of noise in this room coming through the pickups a lot of uh, you know uh, what do they call it electromagnetic interference or whatever stuff that i think is coming off power transformers and things maybe outside my building um and uh, <clears throat> so it bothers me but if i gate or do a lot of noise reduction, not noise, you know, like, like you can go through in a track and logic, obviously and just cut the parts where you're not playing, you know, get, do it tight. And if you do that, it's fine. And that noise is there. I, I have this thing, like, I wonder how much it's actually kind of degrading the guitar tone though. Like, do you ever wonder that? Like all that buzz that's in the guitar tone, it's still there. It's just underneath the sound that you're playing is louder, you know, but that, that, crap is there underneath getting in and i wonder it's got to you know it's 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 resonating or whatever at a frequency and it's got to kind of mess with the tone a little bit even though you can't really hear it when you're playing well you know and if you've of course the more gain and distortion you use and stuff the louder that stuff is so you just have to listen to your mix and see if it's bothering you i mean if you go through and really spend some time editing as far as like cutting out the the offending you know, buzz in the in the silent parts where you're not playing. You can clean it up a lot, but uh, I I do wonder about that though. Like if it's actually messing with the, the kind of you know what I mean, like harmonically the core tone. If it's you know, I wish there's something I could do about it. Uh, in this room, David says, "Hey Pete, England was lucky to have you for so long with the classic rock show, and now we missed you. Thanks, man. I miss it too. Um, hope this all ends soon so we can get you back for sure." We just, by the way, we just put up a video yesterday that's, I think, really fun. Of The link is on my Facebook page um, if you want to check it out. But we put up the, the first video from the show that we filmed in Liverpool. And I think it sounds really good. A, a, a fellow named Gareth that was mixing us for, for the first half of the tour, he ended up um, doing the live recording mix, and it sounds great. He did a terrific job on it. Um, so if you want to check out Who Are You? as done by the classic rock show. I had a lot of fun, uh, it's, it's, you know, trying to basically recreate the album version perfectly and yet rock it live. Uh, I think it sounds really good. Lauren's here. He says, hey, Pete, what humbucker set should I replace my EMGs and my ESP Les Paul style guitar with the Evertune one? Uh, I want a good Les Paul tone, and you're going to give a PT Sig, you say, so you don't want to put thorn buckers in it. Um, mm. hmm. 
I don't know. That's tough because I love the Thornbuckers so much. But if you want to get something else, you know, it's hard to go. Like, I would probably look at something that, to, to be honest, like that's something that like an antiquity from Duncan. Like, look at, at, at some custom shop set of, you know, antiquity Bonamassa, something or other. I, I'm a big Duncan fan. So, and I think they do good work for, uh, you know, I would probably find like an Alico. I mean, I have a set of Alico. I think they're all like two antiquities in a Les Paul standard, and it always sounded really good to me. It made a nice difference that because it certainly opened up the top end and sounded pretty vintage. You know, cl there's a lot of clarity in that guitar, and so I don't know. I, I'm just a Duncan fan. I, they're, they're, you know, Seymour is kind of like you know, not the same, but it's sort of like the boss of guitar pickups or something. It's like I always thought a good slogan for boss is "Let's not make this harder than it needs to be." <laughs> you need a good pedal, you know, get the, you know, it, it, you know, a good flanger or f whatever, just get, get, you know, the boss will do fine. It'll do a good job. And so I sort of feel that way about Seymour's, but of course it's not the same thing because he's a small, smaller company than something like boss. And I slurped. Sorry. Oh, I've got my fuck you cup going here. Sorry about that. I'm not, I don't mean that to any of you guys. It's just uh, my other one was dirty. So <laughs> this isn't mine, by the way, it was just around the studio. I would never. Uh, <laughs> uh, District Sound Lab says, I like a condenser too. Talking about mics, I think. Um, I like condensers on guitar cabs for sure. Um, I became a fan of the FET 47 recently doing something uh, really good sounding on guitar cab. I'd never tried it and the engineer at the studio was at said, you should, you should try it. It's cool. We got a nice one here. And so we did. And sure enough, it's cool. And something coming with that soon. But um, yeah, Fat 47 is nice, although it's kind of a bit of an esoteric, difficult to find microphone. What are other good condensers on guitar cabs? Um, this one sounded pretty good. Uh, this mic I have here, which is a Lewitt. This is what I've been using lately for my uh, sort of voiceover here on videos and stuff. And it's not an expensive microphone, it's about 249 I think. I like this mic a lot. I think it sounds really good. Um, it's the 440, LCT 440 or something it's called, I think. Am I got, have I got that right? LCT 440 Pure. And uh, I, I think this is a terrific sounding mic for the money. And I did do some electric guitars with it in the demo video I did for it, if you want to check it out. So I think that's a nice choice. I always like the uh, Audio-Technica 4050 as well, which is not a crazy expensive. It's six or $700 or something, I think. A nice sounding, good all-purpose uh, um, microphone. Now, I don't know if they make it anymore, actually. They might have a replacement for it, something similar, but that was always a good sounding mic to me. Anyways, what's up from Indiana, says Stephen. Thanks for joining me, guys. I'm sorry I was a little late getting here. Uh, what's going on this morning? Uh, good afternoon from Texas, says Andrew D. What's up? How are you? Benjamin's here from Michigan. Hope you guys are staying safe out there. And uh, uh, on that note, Team at 73 says he's been getting lots of guitar playing while sheltering in place. Me too. Lots of practicing. Hope everyone's taking the time to work on their music. I know I am. Uh, <clears throat> Peter's here. He says, he says, we made it through another week. We did. That's true. And, uh, and it's, it's weird, ain't it? Strange. Strange. I saw a good Twitter post where somebody said, me waking up. Fuck is this? And then me going to sleep. Fuck was that? <laughs> Just like, what are these days? Like, it's very strange. Well, television, you know, isolation, playing guitar, working on music, not going anywhere. I don't really see anybody. I'm going to see a couple people every day, but it's. This is a weird, weird, weird thing. Cheers from Greece, says a Green Beret 84. What's up? What's up? What's up? Scotland checking in there. We got Braveheart Reefer in the house. Good to have you. Missed that place. I had to, I had fun there. Dude, by the way, I put up a, uh, uh, the week before this, I put up, a, I think it was right before my last Sunday live stream, I put up the, the final uh, vlog from the Classic Rock Show tour, and there's some little bit of bagpipery there going on from my uh, Scotland visit and stuff and you know a little bit of um, <clears throat> scenes from Inverness and uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow and stuff so I had a great time up there from from man I mean my roots 
I wasn't born there, but hey, both my uh, granddads. Well, no, sorry, my one granddad. Other one's British all the way, but got some Scottish going on for sure. In my, in my blood. Uh, uh huh, uh huh. Uh, the working bass player says, I always put the 121 back about 14 inches. Yeah, that can work really good if you're using just a 121 ribbon mic on a guitar cab. Put it back a couple feet. Only if you're going to put a 57 on it, though, too, because you want the, if you want a rock tone, you want the aggressiveness of the 57, it won't work to put them both back 14 inches. So, unfortunately, that pesky phase. <laughs> Chris Schultz says AT4050 is still in production and is a great mic. That's good to know. Yeah, it is a really good mic. Every time I've heard it used, especially on live guitars, it was like, man, that sounds awesome in the PA. It's just like really natural. And I used it once for a while on tour with Melissa Etheridge. I got to use a 4050 on my amp, and I, I really liked it. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, hi from uh, Germany, says Jason. I was starting to worry. I know I showed up a little late. Sorry about that. I did, I did, I did. Uh, let's see. Hi, Pete. Where is a good place to start recording? Mic and then what? Well, yeah, you need, a. I would say, at least one good microphone. The one I just showed is a great sort of, you know, this is a good all-rounder. If you got something like this in a 57, you got something nice for acoustic guitar then, and you got a you know, 57 for aggressive electrics and stuff. You can use this guy for anything, vocals and stuff. You could even do drums, like record like a, you know, put the 57 on the kick and put this over the kit, right over the rack tom or something. You'd have a nice mono drum sound, you know, with like a bit of isolation of the kick. Uh, so I would say two mics like that. And then you need a good recording interface, something like, I, I mean, I use UA stuff, um, Apogee UA, Something like that. On a, on a budget, the focus right stuff seems okay, as well as, um, you know, I always like pre Sonus. I think it's pretty good for the money. Uh, yeah. And then you just, you know, can use GarageBand or something to get started if you go to Mac. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesse Smith is here, maybe. My buddy Jesse says Jesse Smith is in the house. Uh, says Stephen, classic rock show legend. I didn't see him in here. I gotta look through the chat to see if he's in here. He's my buddy. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, what else is going on here? Let's see, I'm just looking for uh, for Buzz Hum I desoldered the solid core wire from the bridge to ground. Uh, sorry guys, I'm just checking something here. Uh, oh. I just sent myself a super chat. That was funny. Oh no, I didn't. I see. Okay. Never mind. Sorry. Uh now I just lost the thing I was on. Sorry about that. Oh, somebody said me super. It was bent. Okay. Uh, Pete, when are you going to be on Ben Coombs' show? Oh, yeah. So Ben and I were talking about doing – let me just address that for a second here. Ben, uh, just – do you want to do it this week? And when are we going to do it? You, you say in the comments there. And Ben says, how about a shout-out about tomorrow's show together? I'm good with tomorrow if you're good with tomorrow. That sounds good to me. So we'll do Ben's show tomorrow. Ben, just tell us what time and tell me where to be and I'll be there. Because i got nothing to do except be in this room and work on stuff. All right. Team at 73 says, APT, hey, what's a good reverb pedal uh, for going straight into the front of the amp? Well, I've used many. Um, lately, the most uh, uh, recent sort of choices I've used. Are, where, where is it here? I thought I had one around here. There it is. The MXR uh, reverb. This is a nice one. And I was showing this last week and mentioning how it um, uh, has a mix knob, the blend knob that George Trips, who designed it, you know, knows that you got to put the taper coming on real slow on that in order to get it to work well. So um, this, this pedal works really good in front of an amp, I find, because that mix knob is really forgiving. 
Um, and it does all kinds of stuff, you know, it'll do all the, so it's actually really lovely sounding. There's a, uh, mod reverb and then another setting that's covered up by a dot here that my tech put on there at some points. So I can't remember what it's called, but it might be Epic or something. It sounds just like really great for ambient stuff. And then there's a room and a spring, I think, and plate, you know, all kinds of stuff. So this, this is a really, really good pedal. I find, I, I love the sound of this pedal. It's very rich sounding and really, it sounds really expensive for as simple as it looks. <laughs> uh, I don't know that it is expensive. I don't think it's a super pricey pedal, but it sounds luxurious is my point. Um, the other one's the uh, the Flint. I love the Flint because it's got that great tremolo built in too. So it's a, a two for one deal. So try, check out those two if you want a nice simple reverb. You go in front of an amp. Um, uh, Lauren's recommending the Royer R10 for most of the tone of a 121 for half the price. Another good ribbon mic that I can recommend is um, the uh, Sterling Audio uh, ST170, which is 199. It's very inexpensive, and it's kind of a Royer 122 knockoff. It's active. It sounds awesome. It's what I've got in my cab in the other room right now uh, for a ribbon. So I use it, and. Uh, I, uh, I don't just endorse it. I own the company or whatever. I don't think I used to say. Like, I didn't just, no, nah, not at all. It's not like hair club for men or something. Hello from Ukraine. What's up, George? How are you doing in Ukraine? You staying safe over there? Hope you're all right. And uh, Edbert says, uh, would love to see you performing songs on YouTube so that we can learn them. Uh yeah, I'm going to be doing more and more and more stuff for YouTube as I just sit in this room, you know, and uh, some good stuff coming up. I, I don't know about, I've got some some videos that I want to kick out. One in particular is an Amps in the Zone video that's going to be coming soon for a very, very special amplifier. So it'll be cool. It's a unique amplifier. It's a celebrity-owned amplifier and was done, used on some classic, classic stuff. So when uh, I get to make a video with it. So that's gonna be pretty cool. So that's coming. So I've got some. I got a lot of projects on the on the deck that to keep folks uh, occupied and hopefully enjoying guitar related content. I gotta say, it feels a little weird making like guitar videos through all this. You know, don't you? I mean, it's hard. But then again, when I put up a video, some of the nice comments that pop up generally, like you know, I did one on the boss EQ and. Uh, you know, some of, the, some of the comments, this guy this week, and you see the video for this thing. This thing's rad, by the way. It's an amazing pedal. Um, terrific EQ and great tone shaper. And Anyways, check out the video if you didn't see it. But um, And a lot of people say, like, hey, man, it's nice just a little bit, of, like, uh, to get out of the news cycle and all that. And so, you know, that's what people watch me for, so I'm just going to keep doing it, just keep making guitar stuff and, you know. Can't be all this doom and gloom all the time. We got to take our minds off things or we're going nuts, I guess. So, uh, Danielle says, uh, Hey, Pete, you sold me on the Origin trim pedal doing a classic tone board with Revival Drive and the trim. That's that'll be nice for sure. Um, you know, use the Revival Drive for your Marshally stuff and the uh, the the trim pedal with the overdrive in that for more of a uh you know, brown face fender thing with the tremolo. And uh, you'll have a couple of cool amp tones in there for sure. Classic kind of stuff, tones. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. What else we got here? What else we got here? Let's see. Rocamp says, awesome demo on the Boss EQ200 series. So many options of tones. It really is awesome. I mean... Somebody in one of the, in the comments that kind of irked me said, you know, if you're using, if you need this, then you're using the wrong amp. And it's like, no, dude, like there's no way you can get the level of, you know, if you listen to, if you watch the piece of music, <laughs> you can't carve up a clean channel to get the sound. Like I got the baritone to sound on the beginning with any amplifier, you know, maybe if you took a boogie, you know, Mark II C or whatever and turned the EQ, but it's only a five band, you know, it wouldn't be the same. It's like, uh, you know, the graphic and then. Uh, you, you just, you know, you can't do stuff like that. So with a pedal like this, you can get some crazy, uh, you know, really filtered tones, or you can use it to just subtly change the, the, the EQ of your amplifier. I remember way back in the 80s, my good friend Al, who's a, one of my oldest friends and a really, really smart guy, and he's, he's a, 
uh, mixer live sound guy now. He actually mixed Prince right before he died for a while. And um, uh, but now he's out with the band Three Days Grace from Canada, which is kind of a you know modern hard rock you know band. And uh, uh, he, he mixes that. Well, he's not out with them now because everybody's home. But that that's been his gig for the last couple of years. Anyway, great live sound guy. He was a really good guitar player too, and he he was the first one that showed me, hey, I can put a 31 band graphic in the effect loop of my amp and really fine tune the tone. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That is amazing. Um, not uh, you know, years and years and years later, I was using the uh, Faustine Phantom. I remember for a load box as well as a hot plate for a while. And you know, a hot plate as a load is pretty dull. Um, you know, it'll, it'll you know, it's a re resistive. They I think they say it's partially reactive or something. It was pretty dull sounding load to, it's it's a resistive load um and um uh, i would take the line output of the hot plate into a graphic eq so like low, i was for a while i was using the hot plate to remember to load down my sl68 before the reactive load existed um uh, and i would take a uh a mxr graphic eq pedal on the out the line out of the hot plate before it would go to my recording interface and stuff uh and uh you know eq it and uh with 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 that graphic eq pedal and that sounded great it worked i can you know dump some of those you know because the, the resistive load i always say makes it sound like this you know and all of a sudden it shuts down the high end you get, get kind of more mids than so you can scoop the mids a little bit and stuff and just really fine-tune the tone so using a graphic to optimize pickup tone you can also hear it uh in the in the lead tones on the video i did for it this week like how you can really make a neck pickup clear and optimized even when you're using lots of gain um, and you can use the level slider to nail the front end of the amp to as a, as a clean boost, but then cut lows, cut low mids, boost the right upper mid frequencies and stuff, and say make a neck pickup tone just clear as a bell while adding gain and boost. Um, so they're, they're no one trick pony. And this pedal being able to, with its ability to run two, because it's got two EQs in it, an A and a B EQ. And you can do it so many different ways. You can run them in stereo if you want on two different. But the, the coolest thing, I think, is to run one in front of an amp and then one in the effect loop of an amp or even, say, on the line out of something like the PT-15. You could run it. Uh, and then you, you'd be able to fine-tune the post-EQ just really surgically um, to, to really dial in the amp tone. And in front of the amp, you could boost and, you know, boost the 800 hertz and use it for, like, kind of almost like a Brian May-esque or clock to walk kind of sound, you know, into the front end of the amp uh and and you know alter your lead tones and stuff like that with it. so really really neat and uh, you know if i can find room i'll i don't know how i would do it but if i can find room in my own pedal board i'd love to have this and wired up like that because just to be able to optimize every sound really really cool uh <clears throat> yeah 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 all right uh moving down in the chat a little bit let's see uh, Stealth Parrot is recommending the Nunabur Immerse Reverb, also another great one. So many great ones out there. It's really, really terrific at the ambient kind of stuff. Also kind of the expensive sounds, you know, it's great at that. Uh, Todd Roy is in Nova Scotia, nice place out there. He says, hope you're staying isolated in this room most of the time. And, uh, yeah. Didn't Guthrie Govin play Sir Guitars? He did, yeah. He did. And um, not just because I'm biased, but I liked it best when he was using Sirs, actually. I love Guthrie, by the way. He's a great guy. Anybody that's met him will attest to the fact that he's just a pleasure, really, really humble. He's a very nice person. But um, I, I liked it when he was playing Sirs. I have the next shape. His Guthrie Govan, you know, the the elliptical or whatever they called it, uh, uh, on that Sir Modern I have, that brown modern. I used it in the latest video just for some rhythm parts or whatever. It's actually a really, really great neck shape. One of my favorites for like a shredder as far as the Sir. It might be my favorite actually for a flat radius, kind of the modern, you know, thing. I don't know what it is about the neck. It just feels really, really good. Um, and... Uh, um anyways yeah yeah his, his sir guitars they were great um i wish he'd be back with them actually you know it would be great because 
you know, it was, it was, I don't, there was never any animosity either between, I can't talk about the specifics of the whole thing, but nothing, no hard feelings between him and John or anything like that. Move away. Uh, hello from Portland, Oregon says Duff, uh, using his time to clean, repair and play all old pedals and gear. That's cool. Good time. Well spent. I've been cleaning a little bit, not this room. It's a mess. If you can, you get a little bit of an idea. There's stuff everywhere in here, but, um, I've got some storage in here and stuff that I've been making better better use of and that kind of thing. Does the PT signature get close to a, a Les Paul, says Martin? Well, you know, I kind of think that in some ways it does. It's definitely, I'm realizing more and more the difference in tone between something like, you know, this guitar, which is cool, but a completely different sound, really, than something like my signature, um, which does have warmer mids than something like this. It's a more sort of mid focused. Um, I mean, I love the tone of the PT signature guitar and I, I think it is pretty unique out there uh, as far as being a mahogany based guitar. I like mahogany, you know, mahogany necks and mahogany bodies and stuff. And even with a 25 and a half scale, that's the biggest difference that and the obviously the bolt on neck. So that still gives it the snap, but it's pretty cool, man. Like the snap and clarity, you know, and the, the little bit more, taught i don't know tone or something of a um taught not like i'm teaching you taught like stretch tight <laughs> uh you, you know what i mean like that you get from a 24 and a three quarter scale guitar versus a 25 and a half guitar a 25 and a half guitar has got a little bit more snap to it that thing that always makes it sound slightly fendery um but it's a really nice combo like the mahogany and then that clarity so i think it works really well Close to Les Paul, yes, but it's not as squishy. It's a little bit more, it's, it's got a more punch than a Les Paul, you know, which is cool, I think. That's the best way to describe it, actually, is some punch. It's got a bit more, it's a bit more attack than a Les Paul in a 25 and a half scale, a bit more punch and um, definition to the tone or something. Les Pauls are a little soft to me, which isn't a bad thing. It's just got that, they're a little more creamy, you know. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, 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 so. Jason loves greenbacks, he says. 25 watt with plexi style amps. I would agree. Old greenbacks, they do a nice thing to a uh, plexi style amp. They, they have a, I mean, the right tone for that style amp. I don't like vintage 30s with the plexi style amp. Vintage 30s are okay with a modern game kind of amp, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tall person says, hello from Port Angeles. Really miss not getting the ferry to Victoria. Yeah, that's a nice little trip. Agreed. Victoria, BC, you know, out on Vancouver Island. Port Angeles, down in the States. You can take that ferry to the international waters. I guess, yeah. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. What else have we got here? We are on tomorrow, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I will email you the link before the show time, says Ben. That sounds good. Um, ben, just let me know. I'm going to do a, 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 be on Ben's live stream tomorrow. Let me know if I need to. How are we doing it? Because I do. I stream right out of Google Chrome. Do I need to do anything in particular? Do I need it? Is it Google Hangouts or something? Uh, let me know if I need to install any software or do anything beforehand. Uh, and we will have a live stream tomorrow, 5 p.m. with Ben Coombs, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, what else we got here? Have I ever tried the Ian Thornley signature? Uh, yes, I have. Nice guitar. It's got a V, quite a, quite a prominent V-shaped neck on it, and real versatile pickup switching. Very different than my guitar. Um, I'm not sure what he's doing as far as his classic goes. I don't know any of the specs. Because he's, he's, he's got a classic now that's kind of like a super relic situation and stuff. And what he's using for pickups and stuff. It might be similar. I think he uses fairly hot pickups, either SSH or SSH Plus or something like that. Like... And uh, with, the, you know, lots of switching options and things like that. 
Jay Biggs is up there in the super chat thing, ultimate super high end chat. And he says for the beer coffee fund. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for what you do. Thank you, man. Brad Bailey says what single coil sized humbucker matches well with single coils in a strat. Single coil humbucker. I've never really gotten into those. It might be a good question for somebody like Andy Wood, actually, because I think he recently he was doing a shootout. He might have some videos on his channel where he was looking at like a Duncan little 59 and things like that um, to put in a, a telly to match, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, singles. I'm not really sure. I haven't gotten that into those, the little mini guys, you know. Um, I don't, I don't have a single guitar with one of those in it, to be honest. So if I go humbucker, I go humbucker. Humbucker, full size. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stephen Douglas says, thoughts of, on Reinhold Bogner's comment on your Facebook post about the Mercurial Euphoria video. Didn't see it. Um, is Reinhold upset? I wonder. Do I need to give him a call? I didn't see it. Is there drama? Is he not happy? I would, that would be sad because I, I like Reinhold. I'll have to, I don't know, smooth it over. Maybe he's unhappy. I'm not sure. It's a plug-in. So, I mean, this is hard these days because there's so much modeling stuff out there that's copying something else, isn't there? You know? Maybe he's, maybe, oh, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. You can tell me what he... Uh, what he said and then we'll go from there hope he's not bummed about it but it's hard because yeah man there's so much stuff out there that's that's aiming to shoot for to do a modeling version of something else you know look at an axe effects it's loaded up with models that are you know is it the same with the helix loaded up with models that are a digital simulation of something else and it's not the amp it's not meant you know you're, you're not supposed to take it and plug it into a cabinet it's a digital simulation of something else so where do you draw the line you know i don't know it's a battle that's like a you know difficult to fight i guess tall person says lost the video it's probably not on my end um you know always if you guys if the video seems to freeze or something like that just refresh the page we've got good internet here and it's a uh it's a you know i got good business internet it's fast as hell streaming so on my end so and uh, not only that everybody's using the damn internet these days so uh you know a, a lot of People are streaming and stuff like that at any one time, movies and all kinds of stuff. So if you got issues with the stream, just refresh your stream and hopefully, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because I know it's getting bogged down all over the place from just everybody using the internet because everybody's home. Freddie B says, what up, Pete and everyone? Hope everyone and their families are virus-free and healthy. I'm good for now. Thanks, man. I hope all you guys are too. I do, I do. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Gil says, it's uh, uh, been a while. Just stop in and say hi. Good to have you here. Good to have you here. Um, Christopher Butler says, Guthrie asked Charvel to make a completely custom body shape and some modifications that were not available within one of the Sir Guitar model lines. The interview with the captain from Andertons. That could be. You know, he wanted something, you know. I know he's got, uh, you know, a bridge on there that is kind of a Fender-made version of a Floyd Rose uh, with no fine tuners that they had custom-made. The Floyds with no fine tuners, because I've got one on a guitar over there, but it needs some modification to really work well. The knife edges and things needed to be really sharpened and stuff on it. And I'm sure Fender probably ran into those same issues with Guthrie's guitar, so they just made their own bridge. And these are the kind of things that I guess you can do with Fender. I don't know. But, you know, the thing about being with a company like Fender is um, it's a great big company. And it's just like, I think it's, a, I like Fender. It's a good company, but it's not the same experience. And they can't, you know, there's going to be advantages and disadvantages, I guess, you know. Is the reality, but you know, 
it's kind of like being at a at a record label that's like where you've got a great A and R guy, and, but it's a great big label, and that guy could get transferred or fired or something, and then you're like with somebody else that you didn't know. Maybe they're not such a fan of your band, and, and all those things happen. And this is, you know, I like Fender. I mean, I root for Fender. I pull for Fender. It's a, it's a good, it's a great company, but it is a great big company, you know. And as far as there's there's advantages to definitely being a smaller company. That's you know, I love. Hey, John Surge, one of my best friends, and you can just call him up. And, but is it it is a difficult thing to ask them to just make a new body shape? It's probably you know, it's, it, John spends a lot of time. Something like the modern, I mean, the amount of time that he probably spent, or the the aura, the amount of time he spent because I saw him do it, you know. Uh, putting into designing the body of that guitar. I mean, it, it's months and months and months and months and months and months of him working on things like that. And he's a perfectionist too, but it's like you know, it's a smaller operation, so things take longer and stuff like that. So it's, it's you know, it's it's like you know, time, resources, all those things come into play. So, anyways, um, RC Dad. Sultans of Wing up in the top chat saying, having trouble playing very slightly ahead of each note consistently. Any exercises to really lock in? Can you show an example? Uh, I mean, you have to just practice playing with a click. Showing an example, I don't know if there's something I can show other than I don't have it a, like a metronome I can turn on here very easily right now or something. But if there's a metronome, clicking away just play eighth notes with the metronome and practice playing on top a little bit and then try and lay back and play right in the center and then try and play behind with the click banging away you know and record yourself and listen and see if it sounds right to you that's the only way i can say to do it that's kind of what i did i pr actively practiced with the metronome trying to lay back trying to play center trying to play on top and that's that's the best way to do it you know the metronome is your friend or a drum machine, you know, always. Uh, okay, I'm just going to step back in the in the chat a little bit. Uh, let's see. Pete, which gig did you not get that you still wish you did, says Jason, Jason Carter. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Nine Inch Nails was the biggest one. Uh, probably. Well, there was another one that I've never really talked about, but there, um, someday I'll talk about it, but there's, there's been a few big bands over the years where it's like, and it's not always like I auditioned and didn't get the gig. It's just like the possibility of something arises and it's like, Hey, this might happen. And then it goes away for a reason. Um, that's happened a couple of times, but the most public one I've talked about before is probably the Nine Inch Nails gig, which came up in 2005. Um, and I was out auditioning you know it was a two-month affair really were and for a minute i thought i was like i think i'm in nine inch nails you know uh i think i'm actually doing this and and there was a, a couple days like that and then it didn't happen you know and that sucked so but i was actually in playing with the band like rehearsing with them so it was you know and it felt like i think i'm doing this like it is actually happening um it was over there was a thing over time and when they wanted to start rehearsing they chose another guitar player he didn't work out they called me and said we really want you you know trent Reznor called me at home one day and said i really won't you know I won't just come like when can you come down and do this and i was like give me 24 hours to get the songs together again because i hadn't played with him for a few weeks at that point and he, he said just come down and get the gig i just want you to come down and get the gig and <laughs> so i drove down the next day and played with them and that went really well and um uh, and then some time went by like where a week went by where i didn't hear from them and then i, I had this tour coming up and i called them and said like or i, I emailed trent i said hey I, I i just wanted you to know like i haven't heard from you guys so i don't know what's going on now but i i uh have you know two weeks of dates coming up which is like you know, january and the dates were in like february or something and I said, so, you know, that's it. And then I'll be back on the such and such date. And he wrote me this email back and said, what if I told you that this would cost you your position in the band? And I was like, what does that mean? You know? And um, anyway, he, uh, I said, we should talk on the phone. And then I talked to him on the phone and he explained what was going on and stuff like that. And anyway, it all came down to, they really wanted to start rehearsing on a certain date. I had this tour coming up and, and it was, um, it was just a, like conf conflict of like seven to 10 days, something like that. 
And I didn't want to bug out on the band I was in and leave them high and dry without a guitar player. And I just, and I didn't, and I probably should have is the reality. There's sometimes when it, cause they would have been okay. They had another guitar. It's a long story, but anyways, you know, but I told him that and I kind of held firm and he said, I need to talk to the other guys and talk to them about this and stuff. And then he said, I'll call you back. The phone didn't ring. That was on 10 in the morning. The phone didn't ring till 5 PM. I, I spent that day just in agony. Like, Oh God, what's going to happen. And finally he called and said, can you come down tonight? Uh, to the, to the rehearsal studio. And I said, yeah. And I said, you want me to bring gear? Like you want to jam? And he's like, yeah, bring your stuff. Let's play. And I was like, okay, I'll see you in half an hour. Got off the phone. I was like, I think that's it. I think I'm in Nine Inch Nails now. I think this is going to work out. They're going to work with me on this. And I, I put myself in the car and I was just driving over to the rehearsal studio. Like, this is, I think this is going to happen. And we played that night and stuff. And uh, we had this meeting and long story, but they, uh, you know, it was like, it was kind of like, okay, we're going to, I think this is going to work out sort of thing. And, and they took me in a room. I remember and they showed me a video treatment saying, what do you think about this? Like, you know, from video for the first single and stuff. And just, we're going to get everybody's opinion on this. So I read it and I was like, I, th I think this is happening, you know? It was, it was nuts. But anyways, uh, Chris Petro is up there in the top chat and said, hey, Pete, conversation I had with a friend yesterday. Would you rather play an ugly guitar that plays amazing or a beautiful guitar that's just okay? I'd way rather play an ugly guitar that plays amazing. Uh, way, way, way rather. Uh, I don't I don't care as much about the look as I do about the you know, comfort of the, of the instrument and the tone and stuff. Um, heard the tone talk with Trev. Yeah, I listened to a bit of that too yesterday. The Tre Trev Wilkinson, what a guru! He's a great guy. Uh, him and his wife are super nice people. Glad you're able to hook up with him and cure some issues. You know, I didn't really have anything to do with it. I just kind of helped popularize the bridge. I think by getting the word out that it was out there and getting it on my signature guitar. I was kind of one of the first ones to. Because Trev, you know, they sell through Reverb. I mean, they don't even really have a website. So it's like there's a little bit of, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're lacking a little bit in the marketing department. And, you know, but he makes great stuff. And uh, and so I was able to popularize it, get it out there, even though it was, and it, maybe it was one of those things where it's like, hey, we want one of these. and We can't figure out how to get it. And that stirs some stuff on the Internet always. Right. Some level of interest and stuff when there's a you know that piece of gear that somebody is like that club that you can't get into so i think there was a lot of that noise on the internet and stuff that helped the, and then when the, when the bridge finally was available to you know in the saddles and you get them through the reverb store because that's the the place online where you can go and get things from wilkinson uh they did really well with that and i'm happy about that he's a he made a great bridge i mean he solved a problem that's a uh you know, it stays in tune great. And not only that, it sounds really good and it's relatively easy to use and restring and looks pretty cool. So I think it looks cool. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. All right, you guys. Um, Pete Thorne for mayor says SD design. Mayor of what? <laughs> Which town? Yeah. Stephen Douglas says, love the Nine Inch Nails story. Yeah, man. I mean, shit. I wish that it still hurts when I talk about it, to be honest. And that was in 2005. I would have loved to have done that gig because I don't know. It's just, I had a, I, I really became a fan during the time that I was learning a bunch of the material because I was, I liked them, but I wasn't like a huge fan. And then I learned the material and I got into it. And I was like, oh my God, I want this gig so bad. And I realized kind of through listening more intently, like how I don't know, I'm a big fan of Trent. So he's, and we worked well together. His thing, like, I want you in this part of the song to create a sound that sounds like this go. And then I would go to my rack and pedals and stuff and do something. And then, okay, what about this? And then we'd play and he'd go, that was perfect. This is exactly what I wanted or whatever. And we had this good rapport. Um, and I, I felt like he would be a demanding boss, but that I would rise to that occasion and that it was going to be really fun, you know, not fun. Uh, satisfying on a pleasurable level, you know, <laughs> of creating art. Does that make sense? You know, it's a great book called Pleasure that talks about the difference between fun and feeling that deep seated sense of satisfaction. And uh, it's, a, it's a good book out there. I'm, I'm going to tell you about it in a second because there's somebody up in the top chat. And I'm going to miss it. Edbert Chu is up there and he says, uh, How do you route your buffer on your pedal board? And do we need an output buffer for our wet effects if we use them in the loop? It depends on the design of your loop. If your amp is properly buffered, your amp loop, um, then uh, you don't really 
generally speaking. But uh, the buffer on the pedal board, you want to put a buffer on your board. Um, it, you know, if you've got a fairly sophisticated board with a lot of like stuff on it, it depends if there's any buffered pedals on there. It's, it's a difficult question to answer because you have to look at your board. And if there's already a high quality buffer somewhere close to the, the front of the chain, you don't need another buffer. If there's not, and you're running through five, six, seven pedals and all the sort of, you know, requisite, you know, connections and cables and things like that, you're probably going to want to put a buffer somewhere on there, like a dedicated buffer, a buffered tuner. So, uh, it, it really depends on your board. You have to look at it. But what John Sir always recommends, figure out the length of cable that you like the tone of. So if that's 18 feet or 20 feet or whatever, and maybe it's 25 feet, because a cable has a sound and a certain amount of cable, and depending on what cable you use, there'll be a bit of capacitance buildup, but it's kind of a nice thing sometimes. You know, it can kind of tend, you know, cable tone has a bit, I mean, line six has a, you know, their wireless cable tone. They have like a simulator because it'll warm up the tone and take the edge off a little bit. So you figure out the length of cable that you like the tone of, and then that's the point where you put the buffer. And, um, you know, there's only one way to do that is, uh, you know, plug into your amplifier with a cable that you like, you know, and, and if it's 18 feet or 20 feet or whatever, 25 feet, that's one way to do it. Or you can take like a 15 foot cable or 18 foot cable, plug it into your pedal board or a pedal and then run out of that into your amp and then add another pedal and run out of that into your amp, add another one until it starts to sound like it's degrading. If any one of those pedals buffered though, like it's, it's a boss, it's buffered. So it's going to right after that you're buffered. So it's hard. It's a difficult question to answer with any kind of definitive answer. Um, unless I know exactly what you're using. I tend to use, uh, I, I've got a, on my board, let me think. Yeah, I go into the Friedman buffer bay and I'm buffered right there. So I'm using a 20 foot or 20, sometimes 20, sometimes a little bit longer cable like on stage. That cable goes right into the side of my pedal board through a fuzz face first on the classic rock show tour because um, you don't want to buffer with the fuzz. So to the fuzz face, then into the, Friedman buffer bay, which is a Cornish style buffer and a real high quality buffer it gets buffered at that point and then you know, through the rest of my board and stuff like that. But through the rest of my board, it's like I have a switcher. So it goes right out of that into a wah and uh, a couple other pedals and then hits the music on lab switcher, which has a buffer in it that I don't really need to use. It would be redundant because I'm already using the buffer in the buffer bay. And then the output of the switcher I think I have a buffer turned on there as well that goes out to the amp. Anyway, really depend on what on what you're using. It's tough. Um, okay, I was going to mention. Uh, well, Keating says uh, nine inch nails sounds, it seems like it would be too simple for Pete. Not really. Um, there's some very very unique. It's a real sound gig. There's some really unique guitar sounds. If watch, you know, any show and watch what, uh, um, oh God, I'm spacing on the name of the guitar player now. Who's the guitar player in Nine Inch Nails? It's been doing it forever. I can't believe I can't remember his name, but, um, I'm just having a senior moment, but anyways, um, he's a great player and he's really, really well suited to the band, but he's, there's a lot of tones, you know, a lot of filtered tones and weird things and fuzz. And like, it's a, it's a real parts kind of gig an atmosphere kind of gig. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's probably on track and all that, 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 but that they're doing, but the most, you know, the, the thing with them is that there's a controlled chaos with them. That is really amazing. Um, Reznor sounds like a high maintenance customer, says T Mitz. You know, I've heard, I mean, the drummer that they fired mid tour after that because he was having heart problems on stage. Um, I saw him in a club a year or two after that, and he said, You didn't want to be in the band. You didn't want the gig. But of course, he he had a rough experience because he had a he had a medical condition. He'd been the drummer for a long time in the band, but he had this medical condition pop up and they had to continue on tour and they replaced him with Josh Fries. And uh and I think he probably felt like no love, you know, and I get that, but it's Trent's show. And at the core, he's a businessman. And that's the brutal truth of, you know, and I guess I experienced a microcosm of that in the beginning with what, 
what transpired and how it didn't work out, you know, for me. Uh, but, but by the same token, I liked Trent and I, I felt like I would get along with him well. And I liked his, I don't know. I, I had a good rapport with him over the, you know, six weeks or eight weeks or whatever that I got to see him sometimes and talk to him a little bit and play music with him and then have him ask me to do things and I would do things. And I tell you, okay, here's a little audition story. When I went in to play with them after he said, just come down and get the gig. I said that I'd already been through like a couple, three auditions at that point and stuff. They picked another guitar player, decided they didn't like him. They picked him because he was crazy and he was crawling around on the ground and making pig faces or something like that in his audition. I'm not making this up. That's exactly what, what I was told. And so they liked, cause that's a part of their thing is they're wild on stage. I was, I'm, I'm better at it now, but I was like more reserved back then. So, you know, but sonically he had no, and I've got, you know, he told me this, like, where he's like, I hadn't, you know, I, you were the guy like, um, uh, so, um, anyway, I, I, so then they called me back and he says, come down and just get the gig. So I go down and play some songs with them and they say, okay, we want to see how fast you can learn something. And so we're going to give you, give you this iPod and you learn the song. And it was the song, the collector from, um, the with teeth album and the, the intro and verse is in five, four with this kind of fuzz riff. And then it goes into the chorus and it goes into straight, you know, even time four, four time. And they said, we're going to go in the other room and just sit there, you know, just learn it. Let's take as much time as you need. And then when you're ready, call us and we'll come in. And so they went in the other room of the rehearsal place. And I sat there and I learned this, the, the, the song, the collector, you can listen to it if you want to and hear and I had to sit there on the spot and learn it. And then like, it took me about 20 minutes. And then I said, okay, I'm ready. And they came in and we, the drummer counted it off and we went in and played it. And afterwards, the drummer said, okay, you just played that better than the guy that's been in here trying to play it for the last three weeks, the guy they fired. <laughs> so, hey, hey, I was proud of myself. But that's the kind of stuff, you know, where he was, you know, there was a little bit of trying to stump me going on or whatever. It was like a job interview, you know, but um, I remember, I like that shit, you know, I like that focus of sitting there like with the, okay, like, let's see if I can hang and learning the five, four riff and going, okay, it's fuzz making sound in my pedal board. Okay. Okay. Then it goes into this thing. Oh, I need a crazy sounding delay for that and overdrive and I want it to get louder and like whatever made the sounds. Okay. I'm ready. Let's go. You know? And then, uh, they come in and play and I start playing with that, you know, that focus and going, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be the one that's going to fuck this up. I'm going to nail this song right now. If that makes sense. You know what I mean? That's part of my, um, it's like a, uh, it's, ex there's a little bit of a sports competitiveness to it for me, I guess. I mean, like, I'm going to nail this right now, you know? And I don't know, it's probably some sort of like, if we want to go into therapy, some sort of seeking approval, uh, you know, like issues or something with my father or something like that, you know, where it's like, I'm going to nail this right now. And I want the guy to look at me and be proud, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's probably that kind of stuff. But, um, but so when you say, uh, you know, Trent sounds like a high maintenance customer, maybe I'm used to a lifetime of high maintenance customers, you know? So, you know, that's, uh, that's part of the gig, you know, and, and getting the job. So that brings me back around. I almost forgot the book pleasure. Uh, it was this great book about it, it. It talked about a little bit how, about how when we get older, it's like we want to. Oh, I want to have fun. I want to have fun. I want to. I want to just forget about my problems, and I want to, uh, you know. And many times that can uh, devolve into you know drugs and alcohol and you know whatever your addictions are, and trying to just you know not feel by numbing yourself or that kind of stuff. But true pleasure, the book makes this case, is about. It's not about having fun and about wow, I'm having a great time and going crazy. It's about like the, the kind of uh, laser like focus that maybe a kid in a uh, sandbox making a sandcastle or at the beach has when they're four years old. And they're like, it's serious business. They're not laughing when they're doing it. You know, they're like focused trying to make something. And, and somehow maybe we lose that as we get uh, later on, you know, that was the case. And as musicians, we have this great, connection to that i feel like it's that connection of sitting there working on a new josh smith blues course or whatever that you download from um you know true fire or uh 
tuning out for a little while with and turning on your DAW and your interface and getting a great guitar tone and writing a riff or a song and then programming some drums. And there's this intense focus and you're not laughing and giddy while you're doing it and tuning out. You're actually tuning in and tuning out the world and, and it's that and you experience pleasure on a really high level when you're doing that. I love that, uh, that aspect of music. So anyways, gigs with somebody like Trent, it's just another way to uh, explore that, you know, and see if you can rise to that occasion. So I love that. Um, Josh uh, says, what's your most influential album on your guitar playing? Probably Van Halen one. I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind, you know, just his, uh, I don't know, he changed the world with that stuff. And I was so enamored with, it wasn't the first Van Halen I heard either. You know, I remember like probably the first Van Halen album I bought was probably 1984 because that's right about the time I started getting really into it. But it was 80, it was 83, 82, 83. And then that record comes out and I'm like, Oh, you know, when 81 I started playing guitar and I was, you know, 10 or whatever. And then 82, 83, 11, 12, I start getting into the more, because I was listening to a lot of the Beatles and the Who and stuff like that. My sister was into hard rock and I started getting a little bit more into, you know, I was like, oh, it's Sabbath and Ozzy and, and then ACDC and Iron Maiden and these bands. And then all of a sudden Van Halen. I was like, oh, that was at 13 or whatever, like really powerful to me. And by the time I was 14, I was completely hooked on that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Adrian says the sandbox analogy and laser tight focus of the four year old. Uh, and he digs that. Yeah, it was, it's a good book. If you could find the book, I don't know who wrote it, but you know, that, uh, that, um, you know, I, 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 I like that analogy too, because that made so much sense to me. It's like, oh, yeah, when, when uh, kids, um, you know, when you're young and they, they have that ability to tune things out and just focus on things like, you know, that's these, I don't know, there's a simple, um, there's a simplicity to it. That's so awesome. Um, music therapy is asking SD design. He's looking for a pedal switcher for his studio. Um, so many of them out there, but I'm sure you guys can talk amongst yourselves about that. But yeah, I mean, I use the music on lab, um, RJM, the boss ES8 is great. You know, some, some really good ones out there. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jason Carter says, you should watch the drum audition series for Dream Theater on YouTube. That was intense. I did watch some of that, actually, and I did like it, actually. I like, I like those uh, stories. The, the one about um, the Metallica bass auditions is great, too. You know, that's on YouTube. And, uh, you know... Or he gets the gig and then they give him a million dollars. It's like he wins the lottery. Doesn't know what to say. He's completely out of this. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's it's really it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, the, what, check check out both those: the Dream Theater auditions and the. I mean, you know, it's like pretty wonderful stuff. Uh, B Little says, "Hey Pete, I've, I really love my Kemper for playing at home. What's the best cab you've ever used with the Kemper or other modeling systems for the amp in the room feel?" That's a great question. Um, so I really like the atomic wedges. The, the uh, I think they're great full range. I've got that red sound one here as well. It's really cool. I did a demo for it a little while ago. I will say that I mean Kemper's got one out now too, and I, I somebody was hit, hit me to it. It's got the speaker in it that is very similar, I think, to what I've got in this cabinet right right here. So it's a apropos question you asked, but this is that full range Celestian F12 X200 speaker. This is a full range coaxial kind of driver that looks like a guitar speaker and is meant to feel like a guitar speaker and you can mount it in any 112. Um, so they've kind of come at it from a, a, a perspective of, hey, we're gonna make a speaker that you can just throw in a cabinet and use with your model or give it a try. I put it in here and I was really blown away with actually how great it sounds in this cabinet. Um, and it feels like, a guitar speaker and I don't want to be too redundant because I've talked about it before probably on the show and I don't want to beat myself too much but that basically they explained to me that the concept of it was a guitar speaker is so different than a full range speaker generally speaking 
they're the f- guitar speakers are the furthest thing from flat and robust. They're meant to be kind of like low wattage, at least Celestians for sure. You know, you know, they make 25 watt guitar speakers and stuff. They're, they're thin paper. They move a lot. They're, they're not a flat kind of affair, but they've got a feel to them because of that. You know, the paper moves a lot and stuff and the speaker moves a lot. It's got a this certain feel to it. Whereas a PA type speaker is generally speaking really stiff with very thick paper and the components are really robust and, but they they they're very stiff kind of, thing and that's why maybe a lot of people find playing through a wedge you know you get a qsc powered monitor or something it's like it sounds cool but it doesn't have the feel of my guitar cabinet well this sort of does i think and actually uh brit did a video on this if you watch if you go to the celestian site you'll find a video on the f12 x200 that she made and she plugs her uh hx stomp into it through a matrix power amp and just plays some simple riffs and stuff and you can hear what it sounds like with a mic in the room and it, it it uh you're asking specifically for the amp in the room feel and i think it's a really good option for that now kemper has a cabinet that uses a celestian speaker that's 200 watts it's an oem kind of thing but i bet it's that speaker i bet it's i can't prove that maybe there's something different about it i don't know but it's a 200 watt full range speaker. So th- th- there's definitely gotta be similarity with this if it's not exactly the same with just a Kemper sticker on it. I don't know for sure. So uh, anyways, um, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Kenny Goody says, it's pride, Pete. That's all I think you're talking about the you know getting gigs and doing a good job and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's take pride in your work and then do a good job and stuff and, you know, be your own worst critic and all that. Um, you know, okay. I'm moving down to the bottom of the chat and see what's going on down here. Uh, music therapy lab says, thanks Pete. Love your channel music and videos. Thanks man. Coolest dude on YouTube. Thank you. I appreciate that. There's a lot of cool dudes on YouTube. I don't know if I'm the coolest. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Matias says, not as groundbreaking as EVH, but Slash was great when he came out. The tone on Appetite was incredible. Agreed. I mean, look at the career they built off that one album, you know? I mean, it's kind of amazing. Uh, uh, I, You know, when I think about Appetite, we have to keep in mind the production and the sound and most of the records during that time had a very kind of processed sound to it or something. And they were like kind of Aerosmithy, you know, they had that edge and he was playing a Les Paul, which was really different. Everybody was on super strats, you know, with Floyd's and shredding and he was not doing that, you know, and he brought, he kind of single-handedly probably kept the Les Paul alive during that era. <laughs> you know, his Gibson wasn't in great shape. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a great, it needed to happen, you know, kind of pre grunge. They were like the dirty, really guns and roses. You know, they were, they were dirty rock and roll band. They were, they were not a hair metal band, you know I mean? They kind of looked like, I don't know, Hanoi rocks or something more than, you know, they, they had a, um, it was like a punk. Well, certainly with Duff, you know, in the band too, there was definitely like kind of a punk edge to them meets Aerosmith. And it was dirty and not too shreddy and great songs, you know, great songs with great melodies that were just kind of great classic tunes, you know? So he was a, he was a real, he had a, a, made his mark for sure. I don't think it was groundbreaking as Eddie Van Halen. There was a lot of throwback stuff going on, but it definitely was a cool thing at that point for sure. Uh, music therapy Laz is up there in the top chat thing. And he says, what do you use to power your studio and do you use a power backup? Love your channel. Thanks, man. Um, I've got a, a trip light power conditioner. I've got a, a, a Furman over here in my rack. I don't use it. You know, I've got the power coming out of the wall. But I, basically, I've got a Furman conditioner for my studio stuff. And then a trip light one up there for my amp rack on top of the rack. And all the heads are pretty much plugged into the trip light. Um, and that's it. I should have, a, you know, probably like a... Spend a little bit of money and invest in one of those. Oh, I de- ah, what, what the heck is that? I know I de- uh, wanted to mention the name of that um, 
it's from Japan, and you guys could find this, but I, these are things I think about during the week. I think I brought it up last week, but it's a power thing that Bonamassa is using as well as ACDC, and I think Brian May uses one now, but it's from Japan, and it's a power uh, box thing, conditioner line thing, but not just a conditioner. It'll also do voltage transform, like so you can go 240 to 120 using this box, and it's a rack mount thing. Thing. It's like two rack spaces or three rack spaces, and it's quite expensive. And anyways, that that thing, I would love to have one of those things. Keeps the voltage line voltage constant and lets you, um, you know, go anywhere in the world with your amps and stuff. Uh, so, wish I had one of those. Somebody, somebody, find that thing for me. Do a do a little research. It's the and then we can tell people what it is. If, if somebody doesn't mind doing a Google search, but it's in the ACDC, I think, as well as the Queen Brian May maybe premier guitar uh 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 rig rundown uh anyways uh how is it kemper through a regular cabinet says tour i've you know i haven't done a lot of that i've done a little bit of it like running it through a guitar cabinet um pretty good generally speaking i think it's a good you know and i know a lot of people that think it's um like a kemper going out through the return of a of an actual guitar amp using it as a power amp and then running into guitar cabs people like that and they think it's you know a lot of metal guys like do that i think um you know so you get a little bit of the you know running 412s or vintage 30s or whatever that they probably rent and then bring the kemper things like that um and I, generally speaking from sound guy like my buddy al he's done a lot of uh what band was he out he was out with some hard rock band the guy i mentioned earlier is a sound guy and he was mentioning that's what they were doing running the kemper through uh, amps. They would rent amps, Marshalls or whatever, and then go into the effect return, use cabs and amps, but use the Kemper for all the, you know, the preamp tone or whatever. That's what, you know, they like that rather than going direct. I don't know. Not a rig I've done. I've, my Kemper has a power amp in it, and I've made um, the direct profiles of just the amps, and I was fairly impressed with how the Kemper sounds actually plugged into a guitar cabinet using the direct profiles I made uh, and with no speaker simulation and stuff running right into a guitar cab. Um, what's my experience with injuries like tendonitis and stuff? I've never had full blown tendonitis, but, uh, but you busted the tendons in your wrist by practicing too much. Ah, dude. I mean, I had, I had a thing recently where I, I was recording a solo and I, I my hand was blown out for the day where I got, you know, I was really worried actually it was somewhere in here. It felt like super screwed up and like I couldn't even really play. And it went away relatively quick within a few days. I got lucky, I think, but I do have these things happen. I don't have a lot of experience with it. I think I have a little carpal tunnel. We've talked about it on the show before, but I get sometimes the pins and needles thanks to my fingers and warming up tends to make it go away. It's like getting a little blood flow into my hand and just slowly trying. I, it's, the main thing I do is I start slow these days and I warm up. I always warm up before playing a gig and stuff. Otherwise I'll get like things that feel like shooting, you know, like the nerve things through my fingers when I start playing a gig, just when I'm holding a simple F bar chord or something, you know, that requires a little bit of strength down in the first position, I'll get like a shock through my hand. I hate that shit. And I think it's carpal, you know, that or it's in here. Um, you know, but as long as I warm up, it goes away. And then generally I'm good. If I watch my tension, that's the main thing in my hand to not, not tense up and play too hard. You know, if I just keep it light, which tends to make me play better anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, Danny says slash was always one of those guys that were, I'd be trying to figure out stuff by ear. It was nearly impossible. He's kind of got a slop factor to his playing that, um, especially back then he's more, he's actually more like technically, you know, adept now than I think he ever has been, but, um, he's, a, I think he's really quite a good guitar player, but I, I, back in the day he was, you know, he had a slightly falling down the stairs kind of thing to his solos that were kind of wild. Like listen to the solo on paradise city or something where it starts getting fast towards the end. It's a difficult style to try and it's a kind of off the rails sort of, you know, not a note for note thing is it that you you know trying to get into it i'm mean, like trying to play hendrix note for note you pick out a lick here and there and then it's like i don't know like he's just kind of going off and he never plays a song the same way twice anyway so it's like and i don't think slash really does either i mean maybe he caught you know he'll cop certain obviously melodies and things that are but then he goes off and just does his improv thing 
Uh, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, what else we got here? Playing, yeah, Dylan says playing low fret bar chords without warming up gets me too. Yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. Strange thing, strange thing. Uh, I think the Sound City demo sessions really shaped GNR's sound heard in his later studio recordings. Yeah, I don't know about that. Did they do demos at Sound City? I'm not sure. Um, I know they recorded the record. Appetite was done at, at uh, a captain's studio. Oh, God, man, my memory these days sucks. What the hell is it called? Um, I recorded there in the late 90s. Uh, oh, it starts with a C. What the hell is the studio called? The captain's, you know, Captain and Tennille. <laughs> Somebody named the studio. Lauren, you know this. What was the studio? Oh. I don't like it when I can't remember these things these days. I need to start getting that Prevagen stuff. <laughs> can't remember the name of the studio. Anyways. Uh, okay. What else we got here? Uh, B. Little says, uh, do you mo use mostly your own profiles for Kemper? Yes. Um, do I have any favorite paid profiles? I think Michael Britt does an awesome job, especially for kind of a warm, you know, his Nashville kind of thing. They're great. The, the overall, I mean, if I had to, if you heard the track to live and die in Nashville that I recorded, that was all done with, then this is going back to 2014 or whenever I did that. Um, it was with, uh, his profiles. So, you know, he does, he does really nice ones. Um, uh, if Albert Lee can still play the way he does, there's hope for the rest of us mortals, says Inspire to Victory. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Jimmy Page has the slop, too, says t -Mitz. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, kind of that off the rails, like, you know, he hits like every two out of every three notes, and then there's a, some slop in there, but it's like great because the ideas keep coming, and he's, I wish I could do that. <laughs> When I make a mistake or I feel like I'm playing sloppy or I miss something, it it throws me, you know. And Jimmy's got that down. It's just it's a beautiful thing. Uh, try and learn that rock and roll solo note for note. Exactly. It's very difficult to put. Yeah, or, or the heartbreaker solo. Yeah, try and learn the heartbreaker solo note for note. It's like, it's not really that kind of thing, you know. It's just like. I, I love it, but it's, it's, I could never do it, you know, um, not like that, you know, uh, <clears throat> Alex Lifeson's a little like that, which is neat in Rush. Cause he, he had this wild thing to his playing where the other guys were so accurate and kind of like Neil's almost borderline stiff, you know, in his playing, uh, especially on the, you know, old stuff. He got, he got, uh, you know, saucier later on i feel like and like groovier you know and then but like he's pretty stiff and then like getty like overall to me probably like so amazing like actually like singing playing keys and his bass playing and everything was very uh together musician and then uh alex kind of just a little i mean it's he's such a unique guitar player really isn't he alex, alex life and like with the tones and the chordal thing arpeggios and stuff and then his solo style a lot of jimmy page actually going on there i mean definitely when we think about the early days of you know working man so there's a lot of like zeppelin influence happening i think you know for sure but yeah like more jimmy page going on than 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 anything i think and alex is playing as far as definitely certainly as lead playing you know um yeah 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 Patrick Carroll says, this never doesn't brighten my day. That's me too, man. Thanks for thanks for being here. I love doing this. So much fun. Honestly. Great to think about nothing but guitar for a little while. Um, Richie Blackmore is hard to copy. Also says Wade Jones. I would agree with that. What a terrific style. You know, it's a unique, um, unique guitar uh, and soloing and improv style of he was fearless too that's the one thing these guys have right jimmy page richie blackmore there's this fearlessness that's like all right check out some of this badass shit that i'm about to do right now and then they just go for it and it's like you know 
I love it. You know, like there's this, uh, what's the Richie Blackmore video? You'll find it if, if you look, but uh, it's probably, you know, it's like early seventies and he's like on some TV show and he's playing and he turns way down and he almost turns the guitar off and he, he's taking so long to build some idea and he just does not give a shit. <laughs> They're on TV. It's like a live TV thing. And he just kind of, and I'm sure the band's probably going, what is he doing? I don't know. But it's like, it strikes me as so, and then he, when he comes back again, he just kind of explodes back and he builds it back up. And I wish I could remember what tune it was, but I can't remember shit today. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's really awesome. Uh, and I, 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 I watch that and I try and take away something from it. Jim, Joe Perry is a slop player, says Arthur. I would agree with that. He's, he's pretty sloppy. Uh, I had a dream about Joe Perry last night. Because I was talking about him yesterday with somebody and talking about how he's kind of a kind of that's weird. I just had a bit of a weird deja vu when you said Joe Perry. Anyways, uh, sloppy is good, or at least that's what I keep telling myself. As John can be, you know, you know where Jimmy was so great was his, of course, the notes and the chords and the harmony and everything is so awesome that he came up with. Um, and as a rhythm player. He had the, there's a certain amount of slot, but he's really pretty tight. And you hear it in his acoustic guitar playing. Is it, it was always fascinating because as an acoustic guitarist, he was like really quite accurate to me. It's his lead playing. You know, most people like, you know, if they're a sloppy on electric guitar, you get them on an acoustic and it's really tough because they don't maybe have the strength or whatever. But Jimmy always sounded really together on the acoustic. And then on a um, electric, when it's his soloing style. I mean, he does it on purpose. It's like, you know, it's his... I don't know. It's magical, I guess. I, I, I really grew to appreciate it later on because it's actually very difficult to do. Well, really, he is the only one that can do it. I don't know. It's kind of like trying to play like Jeff Beck. He's not sloppy, you know, but he's like, uh, I got this thing that's just like really difficult to replicate. Eddie Van Halen's a little like that too, but a little bit maybe, you know, Eddie sticks five notes where there's, where you think there's four. You know, and it somehow still sounds groovy and not sloppy. So it's it's interesting, but fun thing. But uh, speaking of Pert, uh, have you seen the video of the Tool drummer live? I have not. Is that does it, no? I haven't. What's that? Is he playing some Rush or something? Would love to check it out. Uh, let's see. Brandon says, know anything about the Sir Thornley pedal in the works? I guess you know some stuff. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he's been working on something for a long time with them, I think. I don't know the state of anything, but, you know, I'm sure it'll be very cool. You know, don't know when, you know, but, and now everything's off the table. I mean, God, is there even going to be a NAM next year? Who knows, you know? But, um yeah, yeah, yeah. Blackmore is pretty epic. It loved me some woman from Tokyo. Totally. That's good stuff. Uh, was it Conway, says Nick White, the studio? No. Um, oh, it was Rumbo. Didn't start with a C. Sorry, Rumbo. I just remembered. Yeah, Rumbo was the studio. I was trying to, it was Captain Nintaniel, you know, I remember them, and it was the captain's studio, and it kind of looked like a ship. That's where that's where Appetite was done. I don't know why I say this starts with a C. Maybe I, maybe I had Conway in my head, but thank you, Nick. You... You brought me around to it eventually. That neuron fired somewhere in there. Uh, Chris Cam says uh, up there in the top chat. Thanks, man. So we don't leave off with Nine Inch Nails. Can you share the story of how you ended up getting in Cornell's band? Uh, it was an audition that um, I got a call. I, I mean, I've probably told this story a hundred times. I don't want to bore anybody that, that's heard it already, but it was a, a late night email that said, if you want to audition, and I'd heard that maybe an audition was coming, but I didn't know when. And I was like, yes, I definitely want to do that. And then I got an email that said, if you want to audition for Chris Cornell, be at this rehearsal studio tomorrow at noon. And it was 1230 at night when I read the email, like 1230 AM. And I was working in the studio and I was like, and, and, and learn these five songs. So I was like, holy shit, uh, how am I going to learn these five songs in the next 11 and a half hours and go audition? But I did. Uh, I went home and got home at one or whatever, set up my rig at home, pedal board, load box, whatever I was using to do it quietly <laughs> and made some sounds, picked some guitars, learned Spoon Man and Cochise and uh, Like a Stone and two songs off his yet to be released solo record that were in the email. Um, and then I, I saw I probably worked for about till like 3.30 a.m. or something. 
and got as much done as I could probably learned two or three songs. And then I woke up at seven thirty AM. I set the alarm, woke up, practiced more till 11 and then went, okay, I got to pack up and go. And I just did the best I could. I drove down there at a time and he was there. And the very, from the very first um, day, you know, I jammed with him and I remember playing those five tunes. And I remember the one thing that stood out about it was that there, there was a lot of amazing guitar players there. And they, a lot of them hadn't learned the tunes. I remember that. They hadn't probably had time, you know. They got probably the same email I did, and they knew maybe one tune or whatever. But So that might have helped me because I was able to get through at least four or four and a half of the songs. Uh, but I remember pulling into the parking lot and being dismayed because I saw a lot of faces. And I was like, holy shit. What, what? Uh, it might, might, you know, you're, the devil on your shoulder tells you to turn around and just drive home. And, uh, uh, you know, like, what am I going to audition when that guy's here, you know? But I, I went in and did it, and I just did the best I could. I got a call back to come back the next day. Went in and played the next day, and uh, yeah, it was a weird. The second one was a little weird, although the second day was the day I think he pulled me aside and asked me, like, so is this something that you would be interested in doing? And I always remember saying to him, uh, you're one of the greatest rock singers of all time, and I would be honored to play with you <laughs> something like that and he just sort of smirked and laughed and he said okay this is want to make sure because i think you'd be i think you'd be good at it and um and, I, and so i felt really good about it but then a week went by before anything else and then i got a call to go down and do it again and that's the day, the day that i found out uh who you know it was going to be kind of like narrowed down there was going to be two guitar players there at that third time i was going to go in and play with them and it was my friend Yogi, who I he was an acquaintance, really. I didn't know him that well at that point. Um, and I called him because I had his phone number. And I said, Yogi, looks like we're going to go down and do this thing tomorrow. I said, let's go in there and get this gig together. You know, let's let's why don't we like split up the parts on the phone right now and stuff. So we're, we're organized when we go in there. And because there'd been a bit of confusion at the second audition where I remember feeling like I wanted to seem like. I wasn't a showboat or whatever. So there was another guitar player that I was auditioning with the second day. And I remember saying, why don't you take the solo on this, you know, in the room? And he'd go, oh, okay, man, that's cool. Yeah, just, you know, go for it. And then I thought he would do the same for me in return, like on a couple of, but he didn't. <laughs> I remember being like, I don't know if this was a mistake or not. So I thought, well, I got, it's a balance. You got to show like what you can do and put your best foot forward, but not seem like you're trying to, you know, be a showy guitar player or whatever, step all over the other guy. So I said to Yogi, let's split up some parts so that it's equal. And by that point, they'd added a few tunes to the, so that we, we were up to about nine songs at that point. So we had a nice split of each guy taking cool parts and stuff. And, you know, and I remember sp splitting it up on the phone with Yogi that night. Uh, and then we got down there and we played the next day with Chris and, our, and one of Chris's comments to the guy that was setting up the auditions was, it's like, these guys have already rehearsed together which was just a simple bit of organization that we did on the phone, you know, and he really appreciated that, I think, and that we were kind of backing each other up and helping. And that was the night, that was the day we got the gig. I, would, I left that day and at five o'clock that evening, right after the audition, I got the call and, uh, you know, okay, Chris wants to hire you. Here's the, here's the deal. And we talked a bit of business on the phone. I remember hanging the phone up just being like, I remember sitting there at my desk and it was the same place where I did that, how to play eruption video, you know, around that was that, room i remember sitting right there at that desk was where i took the phone call i think uh that you see in that video and just being like wow like <laughs> this is gonna be fun and uh and just feeling like and you know what do you what do you say you know it was like i don't know it still feel, it makes me happy to think about right now you know it was cool really 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 cool arthur has a great uh, quote here from Miles Davis. Anybody can play. The note is only 20%. The attitude of the motherfucker who plays it is 80%. That's right. That's actually true. Yeah. Hendrix is good slop. He says Keating. That's true. Yeah. The attitude that, you know, that's why Phil X is so effective, right? In his own crazy way. You know, he's got that crazy energy and stuff, but he puts so much heart into what he's doing. And everybody's like, man, I don't like what that guy's on, you know, that kind of energy. And where Angus Young is another great Phil X style. Uh, there's, how can you not be, you know, 
It's like it's like when I was interviewing Taj, you know, the, the the little guy from Australia that's such a great guitar player, and I said, "What do you like about Anxious playing?" He said, "What's not to like about it?" You know, and that's what he's he's talking about that the eighty percent that Miles Davis is talking about. It's not so much the notes; it's his that it's his essence, you know, that he puts into it is so amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stefan says, uh, Stephen says, uh, Johnny Marr is playing the Bank of California Stadium August 29th. That is if everything happens, right? This summer. Heard you talking about him last week. I'd love to see him some point. I'd love to meet him at some point. I really like Johnny Marr. Um, Pete, what do you think the best from the tone point of view, Digitech Freakout or Sustainer Pickup? Ah, I was I was talking about this yesterday. The, the Freakout is like a, a pedal that creates feedback. If you go, oh, we got 506 people online. We had 500 this week. I'm so stoked about that. Thank you guys for being here. Um, uh, Digitech Freakout or Sustainer? The Sustainer to me is really an interesting and cool thing. can be overused really easily. Um, Maybe it's just the fact that you hit a switch and turn it on and then play and it just kind of goes, which you can do with a freak out pedal. Um, a freak out's not going to sustain as predictably as a sustainer pickup. The freak out, first of all, is kind of a monophonic. Um, it's not a polyphonic, you know, you can't, you're not going to get chords to sustain. You might hit a chord and it'll grab one of the notes and tail it out. Um, so that's a difference. But it also is a little bit more rough around the edges. The freak out than a, than a sustainer pickup. It's got a bit of a uh, a wild card quality to it, like the way it responds, which can be a cool thing. So I just think it's a little rawer sounding than a sustainer pickup. The sustainer is a little bit more of that predictable. It's driving the strings like an Evo thing. Uh, uh, the the freak out doesn't really do that. It won't sustain as much, you know, really. Uh, it's and it'll only do a note at a time, but it's got this great and and the the momentary aspect of it is so awesome. Where when you want to grab a note and make it feedback, you just stand on it and hit that one note and make it scream, and then turn it off. And it's not such a because that's the problem I think right with the the sustainer pickups is uh, the um, tendency to leave it on all the time, and that becomes annoying I think to to the listener that in the past right nobody's ever I don't feel like made the sustainer like a uh, a real part of their style where we've been like, Oh man, that was awesome. You know, it's always like, Oh, it's a little gimmicky. No, I don't, know. I don't have one on a guitar. Maybe I should have one, but it strikes me as a little gimmicky. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Demiola is hard to emulate for sure. Says Bill. Well, he's kind of a, he's got his own thing going on, doesn't he? He's like trying try to emulate Ingve or something. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your opinion on the Grateful Dead. I know nothing about the Grateful Dead. It's one of those bands that I just never really, I know a couple of the, you know, Touch of Grey and stuff. And I, that's it. That's all I know. I didn't really ever listen to them. So it's just something I don't know about. I must confess total ignorance. Um, yeah. Uh, Braxall says, can you please tell me how your thumb moves on the back of the neck as you move from position to position doing fast scales? How should it be and feel? You know, I, I don't really know. Like, it's one of those things I don't really think about. Um, but I think, generally speaking, it's like this. And kind of in the same range as about where my second finger, maybe in between my first and second finger. But that's generally what you, you know, that, that, that arch in my thumb is always kind of like that. And it's around kind of the first or second it's, well, you can see like I hold the neck like that and it just kind of lives right there. Maybe just behind my second finger. If you were to, you know, sure. it's a relic guitar. Uh, how about SRV? SRV was really accurate deadly accuracy i feel like i mean you got to consider he's playing loud with a sound that's really quite clean relatively speaking it's not clean but you know and he he had to be able to control a guitar with 13s on it with that kind of volume 
I mean, it would feed back because it was just so damn loud too, and with the tube screamer and stuff. But I mean, I, I feel like SRV actually, um, you know, he's an accurate player. I have to say, for sure, wild, you know, but accurate. Uh, Derek Trucks, have you met him? I've never met Derek. I'd be scared. <laughs> he's so good. I mean, the way that guy plays is just, you know. Anybody ever see the? I found it fascinating the Greg Cock video where he's emulating uh Derek's slide style he's the only guy I've ever seen do it and he says it's because he pushes down with the slide and actually frets with it and that's how Derek gets those incredible accurate intervals in his slide playing it was like a revelation to me and I've never really worked on it but uh but that's the only guy I've ever heard do it is and of course it would be Greg because Greg's just a freak of nature but uh Check out Greg's Instagram for a terrific uh, uh, off-the-cuff kind of song about toilet paper that he put up uh, yesterday, I think. I loved it. Uh, Jeff says, Andy Wood, have you guys played together? I know Andy, yes, and we actually recorded a song together years ago that's out there somewhere. It was for like a Japanese, it was some sort of charity thing. I can't remember exactly what it was, but anyway, we did record some. I know Andy quite well. Uh do you remember the first time you heard Van Halen? Not the first time. I don't. But I remember around when I heard them. I don't remember being like, oh, my God, I've never heard anything like that. But I do remember like around, you know, it was like, it was 82 or 83 probably. So, you know, the songs on the radio, would, you know, you'd hear Dance the Night Away and then you'd hear, you know, like all those kinds of tunes. But then I remember like when I, I was becoming a guitar player and really becoming aware in 1984, you know, I remember Jump and all that and the solo and going, oh, my God, this guy's amazing. And then, of course, Beat It and all that. And then I kind of went back from there. That's what I remember about it. But I was such a fan by the time that record was out that I saw them on that tour and waited outside in line, got third row floor seats and all that stuff. So I was a freak for it. 82, 83, by the time late 83, when 1984 came out, I was super stoked on them. Neil Young can make you cry just playing a one or two or three note solo. Yeah, I was late to the party on Neil Young, but once I got it, I was like, oh my God, I love Neil Young. You know, he's amazing. Um, any new projects? Uh, well, like I say, I've got a, I got some videos coming that are kind of exciting. So I've got a video that is in the can that I just have to edit. I should probably work on it a bit today and just get it done because it's probably going on six months ago now that I shot this, but it's time to get it out. And it's a song that I recorded years ago that I'm singing on with, um, I, I did, I made a video, Bob Clear Mountain mixed it for me. And I went to a studio and he kind of, as he's mixing, I'm taking video and it's rad because it's like, but if you're interested in music production or mixing, it's something, but, uh, he, he details a little bit about his, um, quite a bit actually about his plugin, uh, which is called Clear Mountains Domain and talking about how he approached, uh, I learned a lot actually about how he, I, I, he was trying to create this excitement really in his mixes that had a lot to do with kind of live music. You know, when you think about Start Me Up and um, really Brian Adams and the, you know, gated reverbs and um, a lot of ambience actually in in his mixes for rock punchy recordings you know born in the usa that kind of excitement that was going on in the those mixes and stuff that he was doing and trying to create an almost like you're at a concert sort of feel um and it was fascinating talking to him about that almost like the the way the sounds would sound you know coming through a big pa in an auditorium he was trying to make his mixes sound like that with a kind of blend and almost a bit of like distortion or something where it's like the hall is mixing with the band and sounding like it's just very exciting and kind of exhilarating. So there's a lot of talk about that in the video. So I really got to get that done. And it's got a, it's a new song for me. And I actually really love the guitar solo I played on it. This is going back. I recorded the song maybe 2012, but I just never put it out. It was just something I wrote for somebody. Um, and it, and it's a, it's a, it's a song with me singing on it. And actually Holly Henderson sang a bunch of background vocals on it. I added stuff to it. Kurt Piscara played drums on it. And you know, this is recently, and I love the track, so I gotta get that video done. That'll be cool. And then the other project I'm kind of working on is another Amps in the Zone video that's a celebrity owned, really cool amp. And I think people that are you know, amp geeks will love it. So I gotta get that, uh, that video out done soon. Gotta keep some surprise, so I can't tell you what it is. Uh, Sean says, Hey Pete, do you prefer monitoring direct PT 15 IR tones or do you like adding ambience to simulate an amp in room when tracking with headphones? 
Um, lately, what I've been doing is adding, uh, I mean, in my DAW, I have um, sends set up on my recording template. So when I start a new song and I'm going to track, or even when I'm just going to jam, I'll pull up my recording template, pull up a, you know, so it opens up and it's got a bunch of guitar tracks ready to go, drums ready to go, all that kind of stuff where I can just start creating. And on each track in the DAW, I've got four sends. One is a mono delay. One is a stereo ping pong delay. One is a pitch shift, kind of like H3000 style. And then one is a room reverb. So I can turn on those sends on any track and pull up instantly some echo, pull up a bit of verb, pull up a bit of pitch shift if I want to get a little bit of, you know. And, and it's just kind of like almost like approaching it like somebody like Clear Mountain or somebody like a, you know, Tristler or Algae or something. They've got their set sort of ambient things going on where it's like instantly they can pull up a send, just set the delay time right. There's your delay on your vocal or on your, and I try and set up my DAW like that. Tim Pierce has a similar thing where, you know, he's he's got his mics on his cab down in his garage and stuff. And then he's got the mics coming in and he can add ambience. And I think he can record it to the tracks like right away. Uh, he, I think he uses outboard, you know, like reverb and delay and stuff like that. I don't think he's doing it in a plug in in a DAW. Uh, that's the way I do it. I do it in the dock because there it is. It's right there and I can just add ambience and stuff to any sound really quickly. So I like to do that. I'll add, you know, a bit of verb, a little bit of echo. If it's a solo guitar, I just turn on the delay right away in the DAW, you know, set it to the subdivision I want, mix it in to, to you know, tweak it, tweak, this. but also I can do it in 20 seconds to set up the, the right amount of ambience or any sound or whatever I want to add to. Um, so that's a nice way to do it, you know. And yeah, I like to do that rather than just the dry guitar. Uh, I should mention, I've been using a cool uh, plugin lately to do impulse responses in my DAW. It's the Get Good Drums um, one, and it's called Zill Zillow Cab or Zilla Cab or so. What's it called? Cabzilla, I think. Anyway, Get Good Drums, GGD, if you look up their uh, plugin for um, impulse responses. It loads up with a bunch of theirs. It comes with a bunch of IRs. Um, and you know cabs built in but then you can load your own so i've loaded selections in and stuff and it's real nice just from a perspective of it's just faders and a uh mute no, uh so there's like eight eight of them that pop up in one instance of the plugin so you can load up to say eight irs or something and there's a pan knob a mute and a solo for all the irs and then big faders looks like a mixer it's awesome it's great really nice to use so that's a, that's a nice way I've been doing some cabs in the DAW and maybe adding some room mics, like Celestian room mics. You can just mix them in with the fader. So check out the, the Get Good Drums. That's a good thing this week that I haven't talked about yet at all, I don't think, is their IR loader. It's pretty nice. Greg's up there in the um, super duper chat thing. Greg Folsom, and he says, uh, thinking of going to a semi-stereo live rig where the split happens at the speaker sims with dual two notes units after one preamp dual two notes units after one preamp any experience in such a thing well i guess kind of i used to use uh two two notes um torpedo live units when i did the last tour i did in france with michelle polnareff i had two pt100s and a two notes torpedo live hosting irs for each head now, they weren't serving as a load, actually, because I had a cabinet on stage because I wanted to have a little bit of live sound on stage. So I had a Marshall 412 that was rented, uh, and I was running it in stereo. So four ohms aside, right, with the two, uh, you know, one of those Marshall, just a G 1275 kind of cab. Didn't really care. I wasn't miking the cabinet. I was just getting some feedback and a little bit. I wanted to flap my pants a little bit, you know, the, the guitar, you know, a little bit of live guitar on stage. So... Um, the cab was serving as load, uh, but I was using the two two notes units to go to the PA. And that was the sound I mainly heard in my in-ears because I was on in-ears. You know, have a little bit of, you could feel it, a little bit of power from the cabinet and stuff, but I was mainly listening in in-ears and, uh, and, and the t with to the, uh, the IRs that were loaded in the two notes. So yeah, I, I've done that. It's a cool way to go. Cool way to go, cool way to go. Uh, what are some cheap overdrive or distortion pedals you'd recommend? Well, Boss, I mean, like, not expensive. The Waza stuff, the SD1 Super super Overdrive is awesome. Uh, the best thing in front of a Marshall for an 80s kind of hair tone. <laughs> uh, 
you know, I did a demo on it and I still think that that's a great guitar sound in front of a crunchy plexi that SD one, uh, is, is killer. Um, what else? Blues driver Waza is cool too. So those are some good inexpensive ones. I mean, a good old, you know, TS nine or TS eight Oh eight. Um, um, what else is cool? I don't know. I mean, a Rocket Archer isn't crazy money, I don't think. That's what I use for my live uh, lead boost. Just looking around here. Um, and I've got around. Um, these pedals are kind of hard to find in the U.S., but this is the Sinvertech uh, number five. This this guy makes great distortion pedals. I mean, look at the amount of stuff on there. It's got three band EQ and presence and resonance. Resonance? Resonance. <laughs> resonance no uh and you know it's like a really full featured distortion box um that's a cool way to go uh what else overdrives distortions for inexpensive i don't know those are some good ones it's hard to beat a boss man i mean honestly you know for i say the super overdrive um even the metal zone right like i did a video for the metal zone uh waza version it's very different than the than the old metal zone i don't like the old metal zone tone really but the the custom tone that's in the the new one that's killer like i mean check out the video i did on it a while back it's really really good so that's a good uh distortion pedal i think for the dough uh okay what else we got here we've got 495 people online it's terrific this week thank you guys for being here we appreciate it I'm going to go down to the bottom of the chat because I'm way behind. Uh, Baza has a new Waza collaboration with JHS. Yeah, I, I, I haven't tried that pedal, but it's really nice. Um, and a bunch of you guys are making nice, uh, like a Joyo Vintage Overdrive. Cost me 35 bucks. A bunch, bunch of you guys are talking in the chat there with some recommendations. So, uh, Wampler makes good choices. I would agree with that. Yeah, Wampler, the, uh, you know, the Plexi Drive and the... Uh, it's so the pinnacle, you know, good sounding pedal for the Van Han the Van Halen-y thing. You're an inspiration person, PT. Thank you. It says Team Mitz. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Thank you. Digitech Bad Monkey. That's always a good one. Uh, Patrick Carroll is in the top chat thing. He says, Ben Vibrato string uh, above. Do you push it away? Ben Vibrato string above. Do you push it away? Sorry, Patrick. I don't understand the question. Ben vibrato string above. Do you push it away? I just push up. Generally support with my second finger if I'm using my third finger for a bend, and then I vibrato and always try and get back to the pitch. That's how I do it. Have I obtained music education, says Alex. Uh, for how long? I went to MI for a year. That's it. And then and I took private lessons here and there from people. I mean, from all kinds of great. You know, everybody from I've talked about my first uh, guitar teacher, Terry McDade, Brian Hughes. Um, I took lessons from Ted Green for a while, which was unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, some terrific players over the years. A guy named Brian Polson showed me some stuff. My friend Al uh, in Canada I took a lot of private lessons. And then just, you know, uh, but as far as formal education, I think is what you're asking about is the MI was it. That's the only thing. How is the PT-15 live? Loud enough? Yes. That's from Jeff. I would put it up and it's pretty much unless you got, you know, unless you're playing some sort of metal and you guys just play ridiculously loud and you're used to a plexi live or something. It's, it's surprisingly, uh, I mean, like I didn't have it anywhere near maxed out doing the tour with the classic rock show band that I did recently. If you guys want to hear it, by the way, check out the guitar. I'm super stoked with the tone. But once again, there's a video. Uh, I'll put the link here just so you guys can check it out. Um, I'm going to find it for you right now. Um, but Classic Rock Show, we did we did Who Are You uh, live. Um, and there's a, there's a video up of it with a you know, pro mix and all that. So Who Are You Classic Rock so I don't want you to leave my chat so or my my thing here, um, but check it out when you get a minute. So I'm really stoked with how it how the guitar tone came out. If anybody wants to know how I did the tone on that, it's my Mac Multi. Here I'm putting it in the 
putting it in the uh, in the chat. I think it'll come up. I think I'm allowed to do that. There we go. There's a link. If anybody wants to open it, another window, you can check it out. It's my Mac Multi with a Bogner Blue in front of the uh, clean channel of the PT15, um, as well as the Wampler Mini Ego Comp. So Wampler Mini Ego Comp into the Bogner Blue into the into the channel set fairly clean. And that's the tone that you hear on there. And I think it rolls. I'm very happy with the way it came out. Wani says, thank you for your continued support to this community. He's up in the in the ultimate super top chat thing. Thanks, bud. Even in these challenging times. Thanks, man. I mean, since you come here, we can forget about uh, about. I got really Canadian there for a minute, didn't I? It's nice, eh? We can forget about all the uh, tough times, eh? That are going on in the world. That was a bad Canadian accent. Sorry. Hmm. Not a coffee. I wish I wasn't. I guess it's probably time to go relatively soon anyway. I'm at 1.50. I'm going to go a little over two hours, and then I'll leave you alone for the rest of your Sunday. Um, I just picked up an old Marshall Governor. That's a nice pedal, says Andrew D. Man, it sounds great. Don't they sound great? The Marshall Governor was a great distortion pedal. I even like the Governor 2. I had one of those, and I thought it was terrific. Timit says, did you study with Paul Gilbert? Uh, Paul G, I assume you mean Paul Gilbert. I've had a private lesson with him, one. I went to his house. It was very expensive. I think it was three or four hundred dollars for the hour, um, but I liked it. And he was a hero of mine, and you know, so it was cool to go there and do it. It was it was money well spent. Uh, and I, I, you know, truth be told, I mean, I, well, you know, I, th I think he's got his online course thing, and it's probably excellent. You probably get some degree of. I think you could send him videos, and he'll respond and things. And I, I bet that's really good. And you probably get just as much, if not more, out of doing that than maybe a private lesson with him. Um, but, uh, so any Ted green lesson stories? Uh, yeah, man. And I mean, okay. So you so Ted is this guy that he's pretty, pretty legendary. Um, okay. Somebody's up in the top chat again and I want, want to answer that. So, uh, thanks Lonnie again for doing the top chat. He, he sent me, he sent me 20 Canadian dollars.